Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and it's episode number 226 of Goulet Q&A and today I'm going to cover talking about the 100th anniversary pilot pens that were just announced this week, why fountain pens improve your handwriting, and what would I do if I had to start it all over. So I'm going to get into all that. Before I do, I just want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. It helps us out. It helps you out. It's really a win for everybody and it doesn't cost a thing. So go ahead and do that. Um, let's see here. Okay. So the last week, Pilot 100th anniversary, Japan announced some of what was going on. It caught us a little bit off guard in the US because we didn't have all of the allocations of pens out. So I will say that. Um, however, um, literally like 30 minutes before <laughs> I shot this video, because I shot this video on Wednesday, I did find out what we're actually going to be getting, we as Goulet Pens. Um, so I'll go ahead and get into it a little bit. So first off, thing I want to say before I get uh, into the nitty gritty on the Pilot 100th anniversary stuff. So this is like, the way Pilot's looking at it, this is really like Pilot Japan. So Pilot has um, distribution set up uh, both in Europe and in the US as well. But Pilot USA is, you know, Pilot's a very, very large company. Pilot USA is not 100 years old. Pilot Japan is 100 years old. So Pilot Japan really wasn't necessarily thinking so global when they created all these products. I know for us from kind of the outside looking in, it seems like, why wouldn't they just make everything for everybody? Um, but that's just not the way that they were kind of viewing it from what I understand. So they created, uh, rather than let's create a special pen that everybody in the world can get, they looked at it as let's create a few truly exceptional, really fantastic pens that will mainly go to Japan and a few will go elsewhere. That's what's ended up happening. Even the Vanishing Point cross lines that they're coming out with, it has nothing to do with the 100th anniversary. Uh, it's just the annual you know, Vanishing Point that's coming out. So there is no you know, pen for the people for Pilot's 100th anniversary. That's really just not the approach that they took on it. So um, if that's what you were hoping or expecting, I'm very sorry if you're disappointed about that. We tried to set that expectation right because I heard that that was probably not the route they were going to go. Uh, and now that we know what pens they made, um, we know. Uh, and the pens they made seem pretty freaking phenomenal, but they're not going to be for everybody. So um, they have one set that's called the um, Seven Gods of Good Fortune. Um, it's limited to 25 sets worldwide. That's it. And it's crazy. It's going to be the, the craziest looking thing uh, in a good way uh, that I think I've ever laid my eyes on. And I think I'm working it out to where uh, we have John Lane, who's been here a couple of times before. Uh, and he's, we got a video with him about uh, some, some Namiki and explaining Chinkin and stuff like that. Um, he's going to be here uh, with a set. So we're going to try to work something out to where we can actually show you the set. Um, because it's pretty fantastic. And it's got a, just a lot of Yurushi, some Makie, some Chinkin. Uh, it's got all kinds of good stuff mixed in there. The artistry is pretty incredible and mind-blowing. So um, the main set is going to be $48,000, which is just like, that gets into a, a realm that I just can hardly conceive. Never would I thought I would have ever like seen or touched a $48,000 set, let alone been able to offer one. So if you are interested, please let me know um, <laughs> because I think we're getting one set in medium nib only. Um, and the set is going to come with seven Namiki Emperor pens. It's going to come in this amazing Makie box and it's going to come with, uh, sorry, Yurushi box. And then it's going to have mini bottles of ink to go along with it um, with like a little, um, like kind of a decorative plate as well. Uh, it's going to be pretty crazy. The ink, I know, has had some confusion. We've gotten a lot of questions about the ink. It's going to be special ink uh, for the 100th anniversary, but it is not going to be available apart from the set this year. Um, I know there's some confusion around that. That's what I've heard. Um, but the ink is going to be available uh, individually. Let's see here. Where did I put those notes? So there's a seven pack of 15 milliliter mini ink bottle sets. They're going to be about $100 each. They're going to be available starting in March. And then um, there's going to be 50 mil bottles at $30 each again in March. And those are not going to be in infinite quantities. They're going to be limited in quantity. So if you're hoping for that, it's going to be a little while. You'll just have to wait. And I apologize uh, if that was unclear in any communication so far. Um, the pens themselves, so there's the seven God pen sets, which is going to be just crazy. And then the individual 
emperors that are in that set are going to be available in limited quantities as individual pens uh, in March as well, and those are going to be $4,800 each. And then there is also an Emperor Fuji, uh, which is $9,600. Uh, there's 100 pens worldwide. And then the Fuji and Hamiji Maru, that is a Yukari size, $1,600. It's 800 pens worldwide, so it's going to be very limited quantities, but it's going to be pretty darn cool. So, um, what else is on the front here? That, that's everything I have for you for pilots. Um, Rachel and I are going to be traveling to Italy next week, which is going to be pretty crazy because um, we've never been outside of the country together in our nearly 17 years together. Uh, neither of us has, have, has been to Italy before. Uh, we're going there for business, so we're going with Yaffa. Um, we already talked about this in right now, but I'll just go a little deeper on it. So we're going with Yaffa. Um, they are a distributor for Stipula, Penider, uh, and Natuno, as well as a bunch of other companies online, and Diplomat, and Monteverde. Uh, and so we are going to go with them. We're going to see the factories. We're going to get to see some of the behind the scenes of how stuff works. Uh, maybe talk about designing some, you know, new pens, dreaming up some new stuff in the future, uh, as well as just really getting a sense of what is, like, what is Florence all about, Naples all about, some of that Italian history and culture, and just trying to understand that a little bit more because we think that'll help us um, just kind of appreciate better the artistry and craftsmanship and stuff like that that comes out of Italy. So that should be pretty darn cool. We're very, very pumped for that. Uh, and so we're going to be gone we're going out of town on Thursday, actually, as we're flying out. But by the time this, this Q&A publishes, we'll pretty much be landing in uh, Florence. Um, we'll be there for, you know, four or five days, and then we'll go down to Naples and Capri and Positano. Uh, it's going to be pretty awesome heading down to the Amalfi Coast. So definitely picked a good business to be in when you can justify being on the Mediterranean uh, for business reasons. So that's pretty cool. We're very, very pumped. It's going to be obviously a lot of business, but also part pleasure as well. Um, the kids are going to be at home. Grandparents are watching them and we are going to, um, really, uh, I'm sure just make some really cool memories. So, um, the rest of the company is going to be rocking and rolling, holding things down while we're gone. Um, we've prepared and, and, uh, all the team's going to take care of everything. Um, so that's not, don't expect anything different there. Um, Q and A is not going to be business as usual next week because I won't be here. Um, but we are going to publish the, the end of our left out series with Lydia. Um, so that'll be publishing next Friday instead of Q&A, just so you can kind of have that on your radar and be aware. Um, and then right now, next week, Drew is going to head those up and he's going to be causing all kinds of trouble with his customer care team. So um, that should be kind of fun. Uh, we have a couple things that launched this week. We have the Stipula Ventidu Toco Ferro in blue. So we had an orange one, which I have tucked away somewhere. I didn't grab the orange one. Um, we had the same pen. It's made out of iron and then uh, it had an orange resin section in the middle. But we did an exclusive one this time that was blue. Uh, so we're pretty pumped about that. Obviously blue is our color so it just totally makes sense. Um, very heavy pen. Almost like a pocket pen but a very dense kind of heavy pocket pen. Piston filler, steel nib, under $200. It's a really interesting pen. Um, the orange one was quite popular and we think the blue one is going to be too. So we have those now. Um, there's a run of 351 of them. Once they're gone, they're gone. That is it, but uh, you can only get them through us. So if you're interested, go ahead and head over. I think we'll have them for several months. I don't think it's gonna like clear out immediately or anything, but you know, if you find that appealing, um, just be aware that that's, that's gonna be limited. Uh, what else did we get? We got the Diplomat Aero in blue. So the Aero has been a rather popular Diplomat pen. It's a solid pen. Like I really, I really enjoy this pen a lot. Um, and the nice thing about this one, um, it's got kind of this silver grip section instead of the gunmetal, which only I think one other color has the silver. Um, it just really matches nicely. The color looks so good. It's been a very popular pen just in the last couple days. Um, but that one, we have a timed uh, launch on this one just for like 30 days. We'll have it and then all the, all the retailers will have it too. Um, and we'll continue to carry it. It's an ongoing color, um, but uh, we have a bit of a jump on it. Uh, and then we have the Monteverde Monza 3 set. So the Monza has been a, um, you know, affordable pen. I know some people have some feelings about it, uh, but what was interesting about this one was the ability to do um, the multiple grip sections on it. And this one is available with a fine, medium, and a flex. 
Uh, so for the price, we thought it was pretty decent and maybe worth a shot. So I've got the flex nib on this one. I did a nib nook for it if you're curious. Um, it's not like a wet noodle kind of flex. It's a steel flex nib. Um, but if you're looking for a pen that has a nice kind of variety of nibs, if you're kind of just starting out, it might be a decent one for you to look into. And we really just wanted to carry it to have it through the holidays. And of course, I'm showing you the green one, but I'm realizing now that this was a sample that I'd got. <laughs> we don't have the green one. Uh, we have the clear one. That's the one that we have right now. I know we've gotten some questions about the clear. I didn't even think about the fact that what I had was a, a sample before. That happens to me a lot. I'll be honest with you, just a little peeking behind the curtain. A lot of times I'm getting pen samples well in, in advance. Like for example, I have this whole bin here of Banu pens. Um, that's all stuff that's yet to be released. Uh, and, and so I'm getting these samples in, we're looking at them. It is, it honestly messes with my brain sometimes of like what I can show and what I can't and what was tweaked from the pre-production sample. So I go to show a pen and be like, oh no, that they changed the nib on that one it's a lot to pack into my brain so anyway that's just first world problems to the extreme right um, another really cool pen that we have that I think will be launched by the time Q&A uh, comes out this week is the Jinhao Dragon in gold and red this pen is just rather epic I'm gonna bring it back up later in this Q&A because uh, I have a reference for it I got a question about pens that I give names to so we already had this dragon and it was so popular we wanted to carry another dragon and uh, you know they actually have like six or seven different dragons and we tried to coordinate but I guess they're having some production um, issues and stuff these are these pens are, are a little bit harder to make from what I understand um, so from Jinhao but anyway we were able to get this one so the gold and red um, very very very, you know, kind of as if the other one wasn't very kind of Chinese looking, at least what we Americanized people think of as kind of Chinese. This very much looks like something you would have like straight up in a Chinese restaurant, right? So anyway, really interesting, very heavy pen, very themed, right? <laughs> Not for everybody, but uh, pretty interesting. I think it's uh, incredibly awesome and amazing. Uh, what else we got? The Platinum Procyon. So this pen... Uh, I'm not even going to talk about it very much because we don't really have many of them. They're like really trickling in. And so a lot of people are doing reviews and getting excited about this pen. I wish I could do like a big bang release of them, but they're just trickling in so much uh, or so little, I guess. We can't even really like talk about them a whole ton just because uh, it's going to get everybody excited about them. And then they're going to be even less available than they already are. Um, so it is a cartridge converter pen. It's a nice mid-range pen, mid pen from Platinum. It does not come with a converter. You got to get that separately. Um, that's kind of how Platinum rolls. Um, but uh, some of the interesting things about it, it's a steel nib. It's a very kind of light pen. It's a metal pen, very light, posts. Um, it's got a resin grip though, which is interesting. Um, and so it's a very comfortable kind of mid-size pen. I think it's going to be really popular. I like the way it writes. I've done a nib nook sample for it. Um, it writes really nicely. The fine nib is actually quite fine, as you may expect with a Japanese pen. Um, and one of the cool things, it's got a slip and seal cap. So the same kind of the, the really good sealing cap like you have on the Platinum Century pens, uh, it's got that on this pen too. So Platinum's really good about that, even on pens like the Preppy. Um, they don't dry out. And then uh, another cool thing about this design, it's a different nib than what they have on some of their other pens, um, but it has a feed where the filler hole is not all the way back up here at the grip like most pens. The filler hole is actually like halfway up the feed. So it makes it much easier to fill a bottle when the ink level gets lower. So that's one of the things that they're kind of touting on this pen. It's got a few interesting kind of colors. It's almost like kind of a matte metallic kind of finish to it. So I think it's going to be a very pleasing pen. I think it's going to be nice once it kind of gets in and people people can get them and have them regularly it's going to be a bit of a frenzy to try to get them now because they're just trickling in so much and then speaking of trickling in <laughs> another one that's been very hot and then kind of came and went basically uh we haven't launched this yet as of the time i'm filming this video but by the time it publishes i'm imagining they will have come and pretty much sold out so this is the twisby eco transparent blue which I think looks really, really cool. It just, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the Eco anyway, and the transparent color just really matches the pen very nicely. And of course, blue is my favorite color. So very, very fitting for me. Uh, I did selfishly take one. So there's one less available to you all <laughs> because of me. Uh, I took a broad nib though, which is not generally the most popular nib size, but it's funny because like, 
pretty much every eco that comes in now, uh, I'm, I'm taking one because I have become a, become a de facto eco, eco tea uh, collector. Uh, but uh, yeah, this one, this one is good. What else we got? Coming soon. Um, so I think it's next week we are going to be getting in the Vanishing Point Crossed Lines, the um, 2018 limited edition. Uh, we're going to have next week as well, I think on Tuesday, unless something crazy happens and it changes, but I think on Tuesday we're going to have the premiere, the new premiere for fall is going to be happening, um, and I'm not going to give you any clues about what that's going to be. And then things that are a little bit more on the horizon, I don't have specific dates for them, um, but the Pilot Custom 823 in smoke is going to be coming, which I'm very pumped about because it looks so good. Um, the Pilot Custom 74 in Extra Fine is going to be coming as well. Pelican M205 in Olivine, we're still waiting on that. Pelican M815 in Royal, uh, sorry, Rodden Royal Platinum, which just looks awesome. Uh, we'll have that. And then the Pelican 8, M800 Stone Garden, which we just found out about this week, uh, is going to be mid-October. So we got a wait list, uh, email list up on the site. For that, if you want, we're ordering up like crazy, but we'll probably get shorted because it's going to be an incredibly popular pen. Um, and then Robert Oster 1980s ink is going to be on the way too. Uh, that's coming all the way from Australia, so I don't know exactly when it's coming, but it's all on order. And that's all stuff you can look forward to here. Lots of stuff happening. I'm telling you, from now, like now until you know the holidays is going to get pretty darn exciting around here. So your wallets will be screaming uh, for you know, one reason, but you'll be screaming for joy for another reason, <laughs> but um, just so much cool stuff is in the works. I'm very, very pumped. All right, let's get into questions for this week, shall we? Let's start out with pen and writing questions. First one is from Nana Loves Jesus 2 on Twitter. If I'm using a dry ink with a medium nib, could I improve the flow by changing to a fine nib? Improve the flow. So you got a dry ink medium nib, you're trying to go with a finer nib to see if maybe it helps. And I can see the logic there. The short answer is no, but I can see the logic. Whereas if you're like, okay, if the ink can maybe only handle a certain amount of flow itself, would going with a, a narrower nib allow the ink to kind of keep up with it a little bit better, I guess? Uh, but it, it doesn't work that way. It's actually kind of the opposite. So the ink is dry, basically, no matter what pen that it's in and what uh, nib size that it's in. It's just going to write a little drier than, say, a wetter ink in any nib size, right? It's just going to, it's going to, and it's hard to explain like even what dry ink is and why it feels that way. Sort of like if you have like dry wine, you know, it's like what actually makes it dry. Um, it can be hard, a little hard to explain, but basically you're going to feel a little bit more drag on the paper. Um, it's not going to be as dark and saturated and flow as, as generously out of the pen. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a little bit tactile, some visual as well. Um, but uh, it can be really good. Dry inks can be really good when you have a pen that's too wet and you want to tame it a little bit, or if you have paper that's super absorbent, you want it to maybe the, the ink, you don't want it to bleed through quite as much. So dry ink can be good in some ways. Um, but if you take a dry ink from a medium nib and you put it in a fine nib, the, if what you're trying to achieve is like a better flow, it's actually going to feel worse in a fine nib because you're going to have a restricted flow on then an even finer nib. So you're going to have less flow because of the nib size right off the bat, and then it's going to be dry on top of that. So what you really want to do is go the opposite direction. You want to go to a broader nib so that you can have a drier ink that's in a wetter nib, and then it'll probably get a little closer to what it is you're trying to achieve. So hope that helps you out there. I don't know if I explained that 100%, but basically the drier the ink, the wetter the nib you want to go if you're trying to achieve more like what you would with a wetter ink. Cool? All right, Real Best Boy on Twitter asked, why is it that when I use fountain pens, I have great handwriting, but when I use ballpoints, it is unpleasant to look at? And my short answer is because ballpoints are just sticks of nonsense and you shouldn't use them, that's why. Um, but, the, but my serious answer though, uh, is that it's most likely because when you're using a ballpoint, and I need to even dig through here to find an example of a ballpoint. I know I have one somewhere just for times like these, for demonstration purposes. Oh, where is my ballpoint? 
this is probably a good thing for you all for my legitimacy. Okay, I have a ballpoint. Um, and this is actually a, a respectable ballpoint. This is a Caran um, 849, one of the better ballpoints out there. But anyway, it's still a ballpoint, so it still should be thrown in the garbage. Um, I'm, k I'm kidding, I really am. I get that that's like, you know, completely mainstream to have a ballpoint. Anyway, uh, so the um, ballpoint pen here, the reason that your handwriting probably looks worse, and I'm gonna make a zillion assumptions here, but uh, that's what I have to do here when I only have like a 10 word question. Um, what's happening is that you're probably changing your grip for when you use a ballpoint pen versus a fountain pen. So a ballpoint pen, probably, especially if you've grown up using ballpoint pens and that's what you've always used, you're probably gonna do what most people do, which is you're going to grip the pen too hard you're going to hold the pen very upright and you're gonna press down too much when you're writing. A lot of people when they're doing that, that's what you have to do to get the ballpoint to write reliably. Um, and you know, you're gonna to have to get it started and do the circles and all that. So basically what happens is you're tensing up your hand, you're writing more with your fingers and not with your hand, wrist, and arm, like elbow muscles. You're probably doing this and you're probably writing like this a lot when you have a ballpoint. It's just a habit thing. And it may not even necessarily be just because of the ballpoint itself. I don't want to just completely pick on ballpoints. But when you're writing with like proper writing posture and stuff like that, you're doing a combination of finger, hand, wrist, and elbow movements. And when you're, when you're writing like more intentionally, more formally. I think the ballpoint is not necessarily the cause of all of that. I think it's part of it, but I think it's also more a reflection on just less... Um, what's the right way to say it? Not preparation, but less emphasis on proper writing posture and proper, proper writing in general. Um, the ballpoint is such a convenience thing that people just grab it and they, they, they come up with whatever which way to hold a pen and to do writing when there is in fact a very scientific way that you're supposed to write. And I'm no master penman, but I have listen to Master Penman uh, about how you're supposed to write and why, and it has a lot to do with your muscles and has a lot to do with writing so that you don't get fatigued. Uh, and that is part of why you practice, is to just like when you have any sport or any instrument that you practice and you get better, then you build up the endurance to be able to do it uh, well, in addition to having your writing look beautiful as well. But if you're not used to writing much, it's the equivalent of like if you work out really irregularly, you never stretch, and you're, you know, just sporadically going and like helping a friend move. You know, you're using muscles weird, you're lifting with your back, you're gonna wake up the next day and you're gonna be all sore. That's part of what's happening from a, in a kind of a metaphorical way, uh, when you're just grabbing a pen and writing with it without having proper kind of hand positioning and writing posture, you're gonna strain muscles uh, and that's going to not only give you hand fatigue and stuff like that, but as your muscles are getting strained, you're either using them in weird ways or they're gonna get tired, so you're gonna end up shifting your writing a lot, you're gonna end up moving your hand around, you're gonna get cramps and stuff like that, and that's gonna make your writing look really random and varied because um, it's not as consistent. When you have something like a fountain pen, and it's, a fountain pen doesn't fix everything, but it will certainly help influence. When you have a fountain pen and you don't have to press down as hard and you can hold the pen at more of a proper angle and generally speaking, it's kind of like anything else. It's like people that buy, you know, really nice stereo systems probably just generally care and appreciate about the sound quality of what they're listening to more so they're gonna be more thoughtful about it. It's like if you are going through all of the trouble to use a fountain pen, you probably are gonna be more thoughtful about your writing position and posture and things like that. Uh, so it's again, it's more correlation and causation kind of thing going on. Um, so you're probably going to be just using it more properly anyway, just because of the thoughtfulness you have of using that. And then especially if you're, if you're actually thoughtful about your hand position and about your writing um, process, then that's certainly going to help. Now, just if you are keeping all of the exact same things in mind and if you just swap out a ballpoint for a fountain pen, um, it's gonna be lessened, that effect, but it's still, it's not going to write under its own weight and stuff as smoothly as a fountain pen would. So you're still going to deal with some of that kind of hand fatigue and stuff like that more than you would uh, with say a fountain pen that's 
obviously why I'm a huge fan and why I think uh, part of it is good. So um, I think that is probably what's going on. Hand fatigue and um, change of hand position and stuff like that. Um, and just not as much thoughtfulness just out of habit or whatever when using a ballpoint is probably part of why your handwriting might look a little bit different. So there you go. Um, okay, got a troubleshooting question here. This is from Instarax on Instagram. What's the most common reason that a fountain pen will leak? Most common reason why it will leak, okay? So this is where all you ballpoint fans can really jump on and be like, yeah, well, we don't have to deal with that, which is not true, ballpoints still leak. But anyway, um, so really a fountain pen, um, as I've heard Richard Binder say, and I'm gonna borrow his, his uh, saying here because I really like it, a fountain pen is really just a controlled leak. That's pretty much all it is. If you think about like when you are, um, you know, having a drink, like at a restaurant or at home or whatever, and you have a straw, and you take your, put your finger over top of the straw and you lift it up and all the, all the liquid stays in the straw, you know, you are dealing with controlling the leak, right? If you just lift the straw straight out, air is able to flow through, the drink flows out, but when you're putting your finger over top, that is changing the amount of pressure that's inside that straw, and that's holding it in there with capillary action. Same thing is happening with a fountain pen, except it's a very, very controlled leak that is coming out. So it's think of like the fountain pen as sort of like, um, if this is a straw, right? You've got the open end of the straw here, which is constrained by the feed and the fins and all that stuff that's going on in here. It's just a very, 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 very thin line in here. And then you've got the top, which is basically plugged by the back of the pen, the, your filling mechanism, right? So you have a very, very controlled leak here, and it's not just going to leak out of the pen because the capillary action is going to actually hold it up inside the pen. Whereas if I take the piston and I undo it, it's gonna then push it out because then it's gonna imbalance the pressure, right? So really every fountain pen is, is leaking when it writes. <laughs> it's just leaking in the way that you want it to. Um, so what's happening when there's a fountain pen leak is there's some kind of imbalance in that pressure. It's really an exchange between ink and air that's happening inside your fountain pen. And all of the elaborate physics and stuff that's been developed with the feed and the filling mechanism, all that stuff, all it is is an effort to try to control that leak. Okay, so what's happening when you're getting a leak that's unintentional is there is an imbalance in there somewhere. And there can be a variety of factors of it. Somebody, some of it could be just pen design. You know, the pen, fountain pens are around for 150 years, so largely, the fountain pen design thing has been pretty much nailed down, though it's not always perfect. Um, but, uh, you know, there could be a number of other things, and often it's environmental factors. Um, you know, changes in temperature can be a really big one, especially like, you know, around here, it's, it's pretty hot. It's September, it's kind of the tail end of summer, but it's still kind of in the hot end. You know, if you get a really hot, uh, you know, vehicle or something like that. You leave your car out, it's parked in the sun, the dashboard could be 120, 130 degrees, and you leave that pen kind of sitting out there, that thing is baking and getting really hot, which is going to increase the pressure of the air inside the pen, especially if you have a very low ink level and a lot of air. And then you take that pen out of your hot car and you walk inside to your nice air conditioned building and it's only 70 degrees inside your building. There's a huge swing there, you know, 50, 60 degree swing that can happen in 30 seconds. That's gonna change the air pressure really drastically. Sorry, change the temperature um, of the air inside the pen is gonna be very different. It's gonna have a higher pressure and it's gonna wanna push ink out of the pen to where there's lower uh, temperature. So, it can happen because of temperature. It can happen because of um, actual air pressure changes, like if you're flying or if you're driving in an area with a lot of altitude changes, that can sometimes happen too. Um, it can happen just from transporting the pen around and you're just jostling it back and forth. You know, again, it's a controlled leak, so if you take this pen and you just fling it, like if I hold it in my hand and I fling it like that, ink is gonna go flying out of this pen. So same thing, if I put it in my pocket and I walk around with it all day, which I do, I do that. I have my, my fountain pen here, which is a very reliable fountain pen, homo sapiens. Um, I have ink inside my cab. Just today I was, I was sitting down and I had somebody that did a job interview um, and I did it and I had like drops of ink on the side of my nib because I carry this pen around in my pocket all day long and I give reckless abandon thought to how I treat this pen because it's a very rough and tumble kind of pen. Um, but uh, I do, I, I get ink that sometimes leaks out of that nib into the cap and it's something that I accept as a lifestyle thing because of the way I carry it around, I carry it in my pocket and I just, whatever, I'm in and out of the building all the time and I'm sometimes running and across the building because I'm late for a meeting or whatever and I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a behavioral thing that I do that can be an influence on it. Um, 
It could also be barometric pressure changes, which this is really interesting. I never really thought about it much uh, before, but uh, I had this happen on uh, several of my pens, one of which was um, this eyedroppered um, Jinhao Shark that I had done. And it's funny because it was pointed nib up, but I noticed after we had Hurricane Florence roll through here that I actually had ink all up in my cap. And I know for a fact I never moved the pen from this position when uh, from before the hurricane came towards afterwards. And of course, when a hurricane comes, it screws up the pressure all kinds of ways. Um, but it was interesting because what happened, I think, is I had uh, my pen when I was writing with it last, had all the ink that was up in the feed, and then I left it sitting up like this. Of course, the ink inside the body all goes down, but the ink inside the feed is still there. But what happened is I had all this air inside the body because I eyedroppered it, and then I had all this ink inside the feed, and there was such a drastic swing in the barometric pressure that even sitting in the exact same place, not moving the pen at all, it actually caused my ink to come up and get all in the cap, all around the grip and everything when that hurricane rolled through. So sometimes it can be barometric pressure, and I never really thought much about that before uh, until I saw it happen for myself with a pen that I knew uh, was just sitting there. Um, so it could be some environmental things like that. It's hard to say, really, back to your, your original question, like what's the most common reason? It's hard to say because, you know, it could be any number of these things, but I think just if I had to lump it all in together, I would say um, the environment that the pen is, is kept in and how it's kind of treated is probably the biggest impact. Um, but really it has to do with when there's a lot of air inside the pen and only a little bit of ink, it's that pressure change due to the environment that is most often causing it to happen. Of course, then if you have like a le uh, like a crack or like your, your converter comes dislodged or something like that, like that's kind of different. That's like more of a mechanical failure of the pen. But I think with a kind of a more normal operating pen, those environmental factors is probably the biggest reason if I had to kind of sum it all up. Cool. All right, I got a couple of personal questions. We're halfway through here, actually. Um, and right about 32 minutes, so that kind of works. Um, okay, personal questions. This is from Adarsh on YouTube. Challenge for Brian. If you've lost all of your fountain pen stuff, all of it, what do you buy with $500? You don't get free samples for ink. <laughs> you can keep all your pen knowledge. Uh, so this is an interesting question for me because you know, when I started out, $500 was basically like an inconceivable amount for me to spend on like my own personal pen stuff. Even though I'm like in the business, uh, I'm in a very different position now than I was when I first started out. So I can very much draw upon my early pen years uh, when I had new mortgage, new baby, and new business and no money. Uh, so I very much resonate with this. So $500 is like, wow, you can actually do a lot with $500. Um, so I do have to kind of suspend myself from reality for this question because the reality is with all the pen knowledge that I have and the people that I know in the pen industry and the pen influence that I have through the, the YouTube things and all the social media and all that, um, the truth is that without, um, without a lot of money, I probably could make some asks for like promotional consideration. <laughs> and get some sweet pen stuff, um, you know, just to be able to promote and, and talk about it and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to pretend like I'm no longer vlogger, blogger, whatever. This is just purely me as a human. I have all my knowledge, but maybe I'm not myself or like in the pen world, like pen business. I'm going to put myself in that situation for the sake of this question because um, I think that's probably more the spirit of the question. So this is just kind of for my own personal use. Um, so I do have a couple of daily carry pens right now. One of them would be out immediately because I have a full-size Visconti Homo Sapiens and that would blow the budget right there. So that pen is immediately out. Um, as much as I love it, it would be out and that's okay because I have some other great ones in here. So um, some of the pens that I immediately came up with, I have one that I use basically every day and that's a Lamy 2000. This would be my nice kind of splurge item, highest dollar item in my $500 uh, thing here. Um, but it's a very reliable pen, it's a workhorse. I have an extra find that I use daily in my some lines a day journal at night and I'll carry it around with me sometimes. It fits my style because it's kind of minimalistic in design. It's got a piston mechanism, which I like. Gold nib, which feels good. Um, decent, decent ink capacity. It's very durable pen. Not a lot of color options, so it just makes it pretty simple to buy. Uh, and I'm a big fan. So that's $160 right there. Um, next, I would go with a Twisby Eco because um, very solid writer. Um, I do like the pen. 
very just colorful, so that kind of balances out some of the you know more plainness of the Lamy 2000. Um, and I would go with probably a broad and a fine nib. So I would have an extra fine in the Lamy 2000, a broad and an eco, and then a fine in an eco, or maybe an eco T, or depending whatever was available at the time. So those two pens would be 58 bucks. Uh, I would go with the Pilot Metropolitan in fine, so that would be kind of like my finer, like my, my really fine nib pen. Metropolitan is a very, very solid pen, and I can get an interesting color on that one too. That could be kind of a nice knock around pen as well. And that's it for pens. I think with those four pens, I'd really be pretty set. You know, if I had to go one eco, I probably could, um, but I really wanted to go for, maybe I'd go for a medium instead of a fine. Maybe I'd try and go, maybe I could go like a more of a fine. See, I'm backing out of my own answer here. I could go with like a fine Lamy 2000, because that's not as drastic a difference from the extra fine as maybe on some other pens. I could go with a medium and a broad on the eco, and then maybe a fine Metropolitan. I don't know, that's a good question. Um, for myself. <laughs> I'd have to think about the nib arrangement, but some of those pens at least. Um, I try and get a variety of different nib sizes there because sometimes I do like to use nibs on finer papers and I want the finer nib, but I also like to use some gushers with some of the inks that I chose. So I'd, why would, I would want to spread. Um, oh, you know what? Oh, maybe I'd want a 1.1 on the Eco. Maybe that's what I should do because I do have some nice shading ink in here. Anyway, I'm already changing my answer enough. Let's move on. Um, I would get an Aston Leather Slip um, just a, it's a simple slip, um, but I've been carrying this one around for like seven years and it is well worn as you can see just nice and broken in um, I've had that in my daily carry. I wouldn't carry as much about the eco those can get scratched up and stuff Lime 2000 is pretty durable too But you know whatever pen that I'm carrying around in my pocket I could keep in my slip and it would be well protected So that's I'd probably invest in one of those because it's not a huge investment um, for notebooks, I would go with probably a traveler's notebook just as my carry around because I do enjoy this, the full size one, um, with some Goulet notebooks kind of stacked in there. So I, you know, put about a hundred bucks in there for, um, you know, travelers with some extra Goulet notebooks. I'm a decent stock of them. I would choose a Leuchtturm some lines a day, which I don't have one to show you because I have it at home because I use one daily. So that's 27 bucks. Um, I use that as like my daily journal. Uh, Rhodia number, uh, 16 pads. Big fan of those, the dot ones. Uh, just general all-around purpose use, I would get you know a few of those, maybe four of them, 20 bucks-ish, somewhere around there. Uh, and then moving on to ink, I would go for Jerbon Emerald of Shavor. Love that color. Get some sheen and shimmer in there. And that's a fun one. Uh, Noodler's Black, nice all-around daily use permanent ink color. So I would that would be my permanent choice. Um, Robert Oster Blue Water Ice because it's a heavy sheen and I really like that shade of blue and it, it's a nice variety. It's got a plastic bottle so it's really good for transporting. Um, in fact, Robert Oster has become more one of my go-to inks for uh, when I fly and when I travel because it's a plastic bottle and I really it's, it's, it's under an, you know it's under an ounce or it is an ounce. Uh, so I don't really have to think about it too much. I just keep it in my backpack and just travel with it. So that would be a good one, Blue Water Ice. And then uh, Diamine Marine. Uh, so that's uh, $28, $12.50, $17, and $15, respectively. So add all of those up with about maybe 30 ish dollars for tax and shipping. I'm assuming I have to pay tax because, you know, this is kind of a worst case scenario for myself here. Um, and that brings me right about to the $500 mark. So I think I could get a really good writing experience. This is all based on my personal enjoyment. Of course, there's all kinds of pens that I would miss uh, with a $500 limit, so to speak, but still a very generous amount. And I think that would be um, pens that I know, pens, ink, and paper that I know I would use on a regular basis and be quite happy with. So if this whole darn thing implodes, I know I could get set back up and be really, really pretty happy for 500 bucks. All right, um, KP Spera one on Twitter asked, has Brian ever named or considered naming one of his pens? Uh, this is interesting. I don't know if I've been asked this before. Uh, not really. I've never been really big into like naming inanimate objects with human names. <laughs> Personally, um, I tend to call my pens by their like formal brand names or, or color model names just because I'm using pens around at work so much uh, and I'm using so much like pen lingo uh, it really helps to be very clear about what it is that I'm talking about with my team so I tend to be very uh, correct and very literal with the pens that I use however I do have a couple of nicknames just a couple 
maybe not like renaming something, but a nickname for something that I might have. Um, and so I can get into those. Um, and these are all very affectionate names. I don't have any pens that I hate that I've given it a bad name. That some of them may sound kind of weird. Um, so the Diplomat Arrow, I'm a fan of this, um, but I call it I call it the Space Blimp. <laughs> Or some people call it the space trash can, um, but uh, I love it. I think it's a little bit blimp looking, you know, and it looks kind of spacey and I don't know, space blimp. Um, so that's my diplomat arrow is the space blimp. Um, let's see here, the pilot plumix. I call it the squid pen uh, because it, you know, just the cap, the way that it is, I'm not a clip or anything, but it's got these roll stops on the cap uh, that make it look kind of squid-like and it's got like a little belly here and you know, the, the, the lines on it make it kind of look like maybe tentacles or something. So the squid. Uh, that's my squid pen. Um, the Jinhao uh, dragon in uh, gold. So, you know, we carry, we've carried the regular dragon. I alluded earlier here, I was going to bring this pen back up. Um, so this dragon, you know, is the dragon pen and it's just, it's just awesome. It's the dragon pen. Um, so that's kind of going to be our like original like dragon pen, right? So this one is the gold one. Um, and this one to me just looks so much more stereotypical, like American Chinese food, you know, restaurant, uh, you know, kind of, of kitschy sort of thing that you would have. I'll admit that it looks a little kitschy. Um, so uh, it made me think of uh, Arrested Development with uh, uh, Ancient Chinese Secret, which was, uh, for those of you that know Arrested Development, it was a store that Joe went into. Uh, I won't say why he was originally going to look there, but he found a sword of destiny as a prop that he used for later. Uh, he was a magician. Anyway, it's way too much to try to explain that show if you're not already into it, but I'm a big fan of the show. So um, now I refer to this pen as Ancient Chinese Secret. Uh, <laughs> and those of around our office that know Arrested Development get a little bit of a chuckle about that one. Um, what else we got here? So this is, I didn't mean for this to happen, but double back-to-back -back, um, Arrested Development references. So this one uh, is a prototype, and I've shown this before a little bit here and there, but this is a, um, a premiere. What happens sometimes is we'll, um, we're getting pretty good at picking colors these days, but sometimes we have some ideas for colors that we want to use for seasonal premieres, um, and we'll get... Um, uh, Edison to uh, prototype them and make a couple different ones and then uh, we'll hang on to the prototypes that are duds. Uh, so this is one of the duds uh, but this one we call Banana Stand because it's a, another Arrested Development reference. If you know the show you get the reference. Uh, there's always money in the Banana Stand. Alright and then uh, another Edison one. This one is not one that I came up with but everybody calls it. It's Unicorn Barf. That's the uh, that's the color. Um, this is uh, our, our premier water lily, which we had. This was our 2016 spring edition pen, uh, but uh, it's the material itself was affectionately known amongst the pen community as unicorn barf. Um, so that's uh, kind of an interesting thing there. So of course I had to go with that. Um, they're all pretty obvious names that are like related to very kind of, you know, specific characteristics uh, of the pens, but um, that's pretty much all I got. You know, I don't have anything uh, more elaborate or, or, or interesting. I don't have anyone named Betsy or Johnny or anything like that. Uh, but uh, those are those are my pen names. Uh, and then to close it out this week, I have a business question from DX Hurst on Twitter. The question is: If you had to start all over again, what would you do differently as a pure online retailer? As a pure online retailer. Um, the simple answer is, well, I mean, we, we've been a pure online retailer, so I don't know if the nature of the question was, you know, if it was to be any different or basically if I had to start all over again. Um, the simple answer is I couldn't have really done much differently because I did the best with what I knew and with the resources I had. So if I just had to go back, I guess maybe if I, if I um, you know, took the question more interestingly and said, like, kind of like if I know, knowing what I know now, if I had to start back where I was and had all the same knowledge, what would I do differently kind of thing? Um, I think I would have probably gotten into fountain pens sooner. Depends on how far back in history I want to go. Um, but I started out making pens for the first three years. And I guess there was, I mean, to, to preface this whole question, I really don't live my life looking back and saying, oh man, like, if only I'd done this or, you know, I really don't beat myself up very much. So for me, it's like, even if I do something and later on I look back and say, gee, it sure would have been a lot better if I'd done it this way. I still look at it in context of knowing what I knew at the time. Um, so that just, that's kind of a blanket statement for, for the whole question here. So anyway, 
I'm making this question not fun. Let me go back. Let me go back. Okay, so if I had to go way back into like the beginning of Goulet pens, um, I did have an appreciation for what it's like to um, have to do a business that doesn't really work with the pen making thing for three years before I got into the pen retailing, um, you know, retailing commercially made pens. Um, and so there is certainly an appreciation there that sticks with me. But of course, if I already had that appreciation and I knew that now, I would have gone back to the very beginning and stopped myself and been like, dude, don't make pens. That's just not going to be your thing start getting into the retailing and vlogging and stuff like that immediately. And I would have leaned into that uh, and gotten a three year jump start uh, ahead of where I was at the time. So that I would have done and then I would have had a more solid foundation there. Uh, what else would I have done? I would have, um, you know, ideally if I'd gone back even further, I could have gone back in college and started getting into that stuff, skipping nib making altogether. And that same itch that I would have had to make pens, I would have put that into messing around with nibs and tuning nibs and stuff like that. I just wasn't aware of fountain pens back when I was making pens um, until like right at the very end. So that would have been fun for me to mess around with nibs to scratch that itch for the making stuff. Um, and then I could have put that to more direct use. Now I have probably 97% of what I learned making pens is not applicable in any way to what I do now. Um, other than just an appreciation. Um, so I would have done, I would have focused more, this one might throw you off a little bit. I would have focused more on the, on the paid side of marketing. Um, you know, I had, I had no money really in the beginning. So there was, um, there was low hanging fruit on, on the side of, well, I didn't have any money. So <laughs> paid advertising was, was not even an option. Um, but there were definitely um, low hanging fruit opportunities that I could have taken advantage of on, on the paid advertising side with like Google Shopping and, and certain pay per click type stuff. Of course, you can go way overboard on that kind of stuff and get to the point where you're annoying and just kind of spammy. But done well, you can reach people that you wouldn't through kind of organic content. Like there might be plenty of people out there that are really could be into pens, but they just don't sit and watch pen videos. You know, they might be interested or shopping around more casually for that kind of thing. And I probably have left um, a lot of opportunity on the table for Goulet pens and left a lot of people um, who have not been introduced to pens who could have otherwise, because I didn't go uh, at least start exploring on some of the paid side of marketing and, and advertising type stuff. So I was very prideful, especially in the beginning. Um, and I'll say, I can say that now because I've reflected on it more, very prideful in my desire to be purely organic in our content and um, to not pay for any advertising at all. That was very much a point of pride um, because I think I, I was so afraid of being a spammer. I'm so afraid of doing things the wrong way. You know, like I had direct sales uh, experience in the past and, you know, I worked on commission in previous roles and stuff like that. And it just, it, it's just not the way I'm wired necessarily. Um, and so it's, 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 I totally get it. It's totally legit for a lot of people, but it just wasn't the way I was wired. And I saw that that environment can encourage some of the wrong behavior. So I kind of looked at it as that way. And I said, I really want nothing to do with that at all. Um, and I've really rethought that in the last two years, pretty much, um, especially as you know, all of these social media channels that we've been so involved in, Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and all that, and Google, um, have gone the way of pay to play and um, not even showing your organic content to the audience that follows you and wants to see your content unless you pay to put in front of them because everybody's drinking from a fire hose on every social media channel. So one way to curate the content that is actually valuable and meaningful is to have um, the people that you are following um, actually pay to put it in front of you. That's one way to look at it. You could look at it more altruistically and say, you should have to pay, that's not fair. Um, but it's also not realistic. Like these, these platforms are running businesses and they need to pay their bills. Um, so I totally get that. It's not anything like that. Um, but I think I was very prideful, especially in the beginning about not doing any paid advertising and all that. And now I just realize that was probably leaving a lot of opportunity on the table and being a little bit silly about that. So I probably would go back and shift my own perspective a little bit that, about like that, educate myself a little bit more, still go about it with the right heart and the right mindset, which is what we're trying to do now. Like now it's a point where yes, we'll serve up some ads in various places on the internet in a way that we think that people will want to see it. 
because um, you're gonna pretty much if you're going on Facebook, you're going on Google, you're going wherever, you're going to see an ad for something. Let's try to make it an ad that is meaningful and helpful and relevant to you. And it's our job to make sure that it's done in that way. And the way that we know that if it's being done in that way well is if you are responding positively to that. So that is on us. But uh, that's something that I would have focused on a little bit more in the beginning. Um, and then I would have defined our mission and values a little bit sooner. Um, so, I mean, if you know our company really well, you know we're very kind of values oriented and we are very culture driven. We're a top workplace in our local city um, and we have our values up there on our web page. And, you know, we spend a lot of time in culture and stuff for our team. Um, but it wasn't always that way. I think it was so organic from within with me and Rachel starting out like that. And, you know, we hired people that we knew or were people that we knew that we knew uh, or like, like maybe a degree removed. Um, but there was so much that things were developing so fast. We didn't sit down and take the time to develop. This is the mission of the Goulet Pen Company until we were four years in. Um, so we were at the point where we had about 20 people in our company before we sat down and said, you know, what is the point of all this? Why, what are our guardrails for when we decide to do something as a company? You know, what are the things that we look for in someone that we hire? Um, and we didn't define it, like sit down and write all that stuff out from the very beginning, partly because we were so busy and partly because it just wasn't on our mind to think about that stuff. We were 25 when we started this business. Who's thinking, what is my mission for this organization that I'm starting that will one day have 40 people in it? How do you define all this? That just wasn't on our radar. So knowing what I know now and how helpful that is towards um, really keeping your entire team focused and motivated and unified. I would have done that from day one before Rachel and I really even started it as a business. I would have defined all that stuff and said, what is this business going to be? What purpose is it going to serve? That would have saved us a lot of meandering around before we finally got to that point. We still run a great organization and we've gotten a lot of clarity here, but it's taken a, a more windy path then if we had defined it, we could have gone more, hey, here's point A, there's point B, we're driving straight towards it. Before it was like, I don't know, we're kind of going over here, let's go in this direction. No, it doesn't quite feel right. Let's go over this, no, this doesn't feel right either. And then we've kind of like wind, been windy less as we've kind of gone further along, but we could have saved ourselves a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of hassle. Um, and then the last thing is I probably would have gotten more help on the media production side of things a little sooner. So. Um, being that I'm kind of like the face uh, in a lot of the videos for Goulet Pens and I, I recognize that I kind of represent our brand in a lot of ways, um, you know, of course, it's a team effort with what we're doing here. Uh, but in the early days, especially like all the video prep and all this kind of stuff, all the media side of things was really like that was my thing, that was my baby, that was my heart behind a lot of what we were doing here. Um, so you know, the fulfillment side of things, the inventory management, the HR side of things, that stuff was a little easier to kind of let go of because it wasn't as much like what I was drawn to and kind of my heart and soul in a lot of ways. Um, and so I waited longer to get help on that because I had a harder time letting that kind of stuff go. Um, now I see the talent and the, the creativity that um, really all of our people have, but really especially of our media team. I'll give them some props. Um, you know, I would, have, I would have defined what that should look like a little better, let it, some things go a little sooner, um, look to really build up more of a team there sooner. Um, I let some things go too long and uh, that caused some, some pain along the way and put too much of a stress, put too much of a bottleneck on me um, and made things harder for the team. So I would, have, I would have focused on that really earlier on, but it was just tough because back in the day, I didn't know that that was gonna be such an important part of how all this was gonna get built. Um, I had inklings, I had notions, but it's difficult when you have a team of like five people to say, yeah, I'm gonna hire a full-time photographer or a full-time videographer or whatever. We're so used to being so scrappy and just trying to do everything ourselves first before we hired anybody that, you know, we ha it, was, it was always difficult to navigate when to hire the right type of role, especially new roles we'd never had. How do you define it? How do you determine success? How do you find what person and hire for the right, you know, qualifications and all that? It's really difficult, so I'm getting tired just talking about how hard it all was in the beginning. Things are a little easier now in some ways. Um, but anyway, so 
um, yeah, a nice little trip down memory lane here. But still, as I think back about it, it was such a fun journey. And at the time, it was so just like day to day, trying to figure out like what the heck was going on and what was, how was I defining all these different aspects of what was happening in the company. Um, and now, of course, I have much better perspective and all that. And I really appreciate like, man, what a, what a trip, what a journey it's been so far. And I'm probably going to feel the same way five years from now and look back to where I am now and be like, man, I had no idea what I was doing, what I was in for. Um, it's still kind of fun. So anyway, thank you, DX Hurst, for letting me uh, take that trip down memory lane here. Hopefully it gives you a little insight into my perspective anyway. I just keep rambling on about this kind of stuff. You all keep asking like business and personal questions like this. And I'm always inclined to take them because I feel like that's a unique you know, kind of perspective I can lend on things. And I do get a lot of feedback about like, you know, people who maybe are like independents, but, but really are interested in kind of the business aspect of things because it touches more of their life in a different way. So I, I'm inclined to take these types of questions on. But, you know, a small part of me is also like, man, is this just my ego that I'm taking these questions? <laughs> I hope not. So let me know if these add value to you. Um, I, would, I appreciate that feedback. I want to make sure that every Q&A is like packed full of value for you all. All right. That's it for this week. Um, so, again, I'm going to take off next week. Lydia will be here with the right, uh, the, the left out, so be sure to give her some love. Uh, and then I'll be back the following week and right now is in Q&A. Probably a little tired, but maybe with some cool stories to tell. All right, that's what I got for this week. My question of the week is, do you have any names for your pens? Maybe kitschy names like I have, or uh, like actual people names, <laughs> uh, or pet names, or something like that for any of your pens. I'd be curious to hear about that in the comments. Um, and then my writing prompt for you to actually pick up your pen and write with it on paper is, what would be your dream vacation if you could go anywhere? Think about that, write it out, and hey, you know, I hear that uh, if you have a goal, if you physically write it down on paper, it increases the chances of it actually happening. So if you have a dream vacation and you write it down, I'm not gonna make any promises, but you know, it could be, it could slightly increase the chances of you actually going on that dream vacation. So nice little interesting thought. You can dream it up a little bit. Fun little exercise for you to use your pens. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can check out a lot of the pens that I talked about here on gouletpens.com. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to follow me on Instagram if you want to see what I'm up to while I'm in Italy. Appreciate it very much. I'm always honored by your time. Thanks for watching and right on.